and he went out throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Having a little uh, fun this morning, I have shared with Pastor Kim already what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do part two of his marvelous sermon last week. We didn't actually plan that, but I was so enamored with his very clear and helpful way, and you might remember this now, of understanding who speaks for God in this culture where so many Voices claim they are speaking for God. Who are we to listen to? Who are we to follow? And he did this marvelous job of talking about things like, well, is the word all in what they are saying? Or is it just some people? I mean, how practical is that? And I'm using it as I listen to this plethora of voices all over social media, all the time. Uh, I'm going to do part two with that. And I am going to use the word compassion, as you may have heard in the children's sermon as well. All right, our story begins today with Jesus entering the house of Peter's mother-in-law. I was there in the 90s. You know, you're there and you may be at the house that Jesus went to and you may not be. It's okay. It's not the major reason I go. It feels kind of nice. Jesus was at least very near here, you know, and that's, that's nice. But I remember for an hour what we did over the ruins of this typical Galilean house. There were just a few remains left, but you could see where rooms were and so on. And we talked for an hour about the meaning of Jesus healing people and curing people. And social anthropologists make a distinction, by the way, between curing and healing. You may be aware of this. Uh, curing in ancient days was curing your headache, your toothache, some biomedical, physical thing that you, uh, was keeping you ill. That was curing. Um, it doesn't happen all that often in the Bible. We have uh, relatively few examples. But healing, we have all kinds of examples not just in the Bible, but in your life and in your family's life and in the world. Uh, healing has, is bigger. Healing is the deepest illnesses that we have. Now, I will share with you that my father introduced me to Carl Jung. Not personally, I'm not, I know, I'm, I seem old. <laughs> he died in 1960. But he introduced me to the writings of Carl Jung, who I just absolutely ate up. Uh, Jung was a contemporary of Freud. They were good friends for a while. Then they sort of went different ways. Carl Jung was deeply spiritual. His father was a minister. And he, he has said in many of his writings, most of the people who come to physicians and who come to me for help, it's not a physical thing at all. It's a deeply existential lack of meaning in their lives. They've been torn from a, a, a relationship with their family, with their friends, with society. And they need healing. They need their life back, meaning they, lead, they need their purpose for life back. And when you don't have purpose and meaning, and meaning in your life, you can get sick physically. And we all know this. Uh, that's what Jesus is doing in Capernaum at the house of Peter's mother-in-law. She's sick with a fever. Jesus... Uh, Cures her, yes, the fever leaves, and then he heals her. Because in his twin action, she gets up and serves him. Now, what does it mean? It means she's finding her place again. And don't, and please understand, it's not the role of women and the role of men. We read back into scripture sometimes, we shouldn't do that. Um, Jesus isn't defining a woman's role as serving. That's just what her uh, purpose at that time was and she's delighted to do it and she's getting back her life 
Healing is about getting back purpose and meaning and joy again because compassion was used by someone, in this case Jesus, who did it all the time. Um, this is, I can't not tell you this because I have to smile every time I think of it, especially with the toilet paper here today. Uh, <laughs> what is the root word for compassion in Hebrew? Rakim. And Rakim simply means that God's major character of life comes out of like a womb. It comes out of the center, the core of a person. So the Hebrew uh, ideology of the word uh, compassion is womb. Now the Greek word, uh, its root word comes from, now get this, the bowels. I honestly didn't think of that until uh, I was in here on Friday and I saw this magnificent tower of toilet paper and I thought, <laughs> Luther would love this. <laughs> He's so earthy, you know. The bowels, the kidneys, uh, it can include the heart. But the point is your intestines. Uh, the Greek word has to do with uh, your intestines being moved. <laughs> I'll just stop right there. But the point is, the point is it comes from the core of who you are, see? Because when you think of your, it's your guts. Compassion is not an add-on thing. It's the very heart of God. That's what it's saying. You can do in life without a finger, but you can't do in life without your guts very long, can you? And that's what the scripture is trying to teach us about God. God is compassion. So when we hear a lot of flap trap on social media about God is going to get this person and that person and we don't have to care about immigrants and all this stuff, you can say to yourself, that's the hint that it's not about God at all. That person is not speaking for God. Compassion uh, in the Latin means to suffer with someone else. It's more than a feeling. It's more than an attitude. It's more than empathy, which is good. We should have empathy. But compassion, the Latin root, translated into English, means to suffer deeply with someone else and to make sure you try to put an end to the suffering. See? That's deep. That's a lot more than a feeling. And that's what's happening here with Jesus. How does it work? All right. Millie was one of those people that would be the farthest kind of person that would be applauded in American culture. She was a single mom, uneducated. She didn't have a job. She was on government assistance. You know, a few years ago, uh, several presidents used the, the cruelest uh, description of people like that and called her welfare queen. Oh, well, look at all these welfare queens we have out, having no idea what Millie's real life was about. Millie happened to be a member at St. Paul Lutheran in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the pastor of that congregation at that time was one that you already know, Daniel Erlander. Erlander got his degree here at PLU. He went on to be ordained. He went to the School of Theology at Chicago. He was a theologian in residence there. He wrote a number of pamphlets and books, one of which all kinds of Lutheran churches across this country use, called Baptize We Live. We have it here. Uh, I have not personally met Erlander. I've heard him speak. I've read most of his books. An amazing pastor. Millie, this welfare queen, was a member of his parish. She had two boys, four and six. One day, a parent's worst nightmare happened. The younger boy, four years old, did what boys do when you're playing ball in the yard and the ball goes into the street. You follow that ball. And he did. It was a very poor part of town. It was an area where the police were always racing up and down the roads for some emergency and a police officer accidentally struck him and hurled him to the side of the road. The ambulance came, but by the time the ambulance got him to the hospital, he was already pronounced dead. Pastor Erlander got a call. 
would you please come down to the hospital? A woman here needs your help. And of course he did. And he went to the emergency room where she was uh, folded up like a towel, weeping, as you can imagine. And he sat with her. He prayed with her. He held her hand. He did a ministry of presence, of compassion. What did I say the Latin word was? Suffering together with another person. In my role as bishop, I would remind pastors that it isn't always just about fancy preaching. You stay with people and suffer with them. That's a part of what it means to be ordained as a pastor in the church. The next morning, Pastor Erlander got a call from the police chief, known to be very firm and tough. And the police chief said, I would like to visit in your office, Pastor, if that's available, with you and with Millie. Could you call her? He said, absolutely. He calls Millie, she agrees. And they sit together in his office and this great big police chief, firm and tough, was in tears and tried to speak to Millie. He tried three or four times and not a word would come out. He finally leaned into her and with very broken language, he said, I am so sorry about what happened to your son. We are all sorry. And then he couldn't speak anymore. Millie, after a long pause, looking straight at him, said, I forgive the police officer that struck my child and accidentally killed him. I forgive you, and I forgive the police department. And he didn't know what to say. He couldn't say anything. She waited for a long time. Finally, she stood up, put a hand on his shoulder, and had to leave. Now, the police officer is looking at Pastor Erlander, and he says, I'm sorry I broke up. And Pastor said, no, do not be sorry. That's a sign of what? Compassion. Suffering from the bowels, the intestines, the heart, the kidneys of your core with somebody else and doing something about it. Not just feeling that way, which he did with his tears. But he came to see her directly. At the funeral, Pastor Erlander stood with Millie and her remaining son and a few family members and friends in line to go into the funeral liturgy. And he noticed in the second to the last pew, an Hispanic man quietly crying with his head in his hands. And he wondered, he didn't know, could this be what? Could this be the officer that accidentally killed Millie's son? Well, they, they went in, they had the funeral liturgy, and on the way out, at the recessional, two-thirds of the way, back to the narthex. Millie stops the whole procession, recession. She uh, breaks rank and she goes over to that Hispanic man, whispers something in his ear. He gets up, follows her, and goes into line with her son downstairs for the luncheon. Uh, now Pastor Erlander has a better idea who this might be, see? Well, he's got to go take his robes off because, well, you know, we, we wear all these robes and it's hard to eat. And he's taking his robes off. When he comes into the uh, luncheon fellowship hall, do you know what he sees? I'll bet you can imagine. That young Hispanic police officer, who was in fact the one who accidentally hit her child with a car, was sitting next to Millie. He on one side, her living son on the other, and smiling, he got his life back. He was healed, see? He was not forever guilty anymore. He was loved by a woman whose son he accidentally killed. He was brought back into society. That's what healing is, see? How do you know when someone speaks for God? Do you hear the words compassion in the voice? Do you feel the word compassion? Are they from their very core suffering with somebody else? Or are they saying, let the immigrants just stay on the other side? 
just as one example. I had 13, but I, I won't go into them. But I want you to think about this. Who speaks for God? Those who have God's compassion and no one else. Now, do we do this all the time? Again, you've heard me say that we're Lutheran, we're saint and sinner. No, we don't. But every time we risk doing it, we have no idea the ripple effect of healing for that person. The goal of Christianity is not to become, you know, more like your favorite rock star. The goal of Christianity is not to, you know, amass wealth. It's not to uh, become more like your favorite political party. The goal is to have Christ's compassion and not only have it, but use it. Millie is a marvelous example for us of who speaks for God because she used compassion and through her words she channeled healing, Christ's healing, through her words, through her gestures into that young man's life. You are a gifted, blessed, and beloved people of God, Agnus Dei. I've been here long enough to know all the things you do, you know, uh, as groups, as official groups in the congregation, and I know because I've visited many of you how you do it individually, living out the compassion from your inner core as a gift from God through Christ. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow has not yet come. Sister and brother in Christ, speak tenderly to your mom today, to your dad, to your kids, to your estranged sister. Speak tenderly with compassion from your core. Make friends of that enemy that you've had for 34 years and sort of forgot about. You have no idea what the ripple effect from compassion can do to heal that person. And in doing so, every single one of those that are healed and brought back into existential joy make a difference in the world. I believe it. For my money, it really works. Be compassionate today. In the name of our Creator, our Savior, and the strength to live out compassion. Amen.